through our journey and through the documentary of Mallory's Army, what I really wanted to do was continue this voice and continue to showcase other people's stories. Because I think that one of the biggest obstacles that we have is that people feel sorry for you for a few months. You know, they, they feel sorry, but then they expect you to move on. And what they don't understand is that you never move on. So I wanted to use my life to showcase other people's stories and the things that happen to them, but also what they're doing. They're, they're taking on challenges that I didn't know needed to be taken on. And now that I'm living it, I go, oh, now, now I can get it. I want to thank Diane and Seth Grossman, Jen Stilwell, and the entire Mallory's Army team for being here tonight. When Mallory passed away, the knee jerk from my friends and family was, anybody's going to speak about what happened to Mallory, it's going to be you. And I just was really very anti this. And I guess I was putting it into the category of the fist pumping, loud music, anti-bullying presentations. And I was like, that's just not me. The fact that you've come here this evening to our community to share your story, Mallory's story, in hopes that no parent here must ever suffer what you have suffered is one of the bravest, kindest, and most courageous things I've ever seen. Mallory's Army is a strong voice for all the children and the families that have been victims of bullying. It is a fight for hope, awareness, and change so that no child must endure the pain of bullying. And I think it because the story was so personal to myself and that Mallory's story is not a joyful story. It's a very sad and it's a dark place to be, and I thought, how can I put that into a presentation that impacts children? We first met Mrs. Grossman on November 19, 2017. She came into our school to speak to all of us about the responsibility we all have to be the catalyst for positive change. When it first was presented to me to do school presentations, I didn't want to do them. I didn't like the idea of it. And I definitely didn't want to put Mallory on display. And that's what it felt like. But as I started to talk more about it, and as I started to have conversations, not only with friends and family, but also having conversations with myself. Diane responded to a parent on Facebook today. She said, sometimes I would like to crawl up in a ball, but imagine the world without people who knock down barriers. Diane, you keep knocking down the barriers, and we will be right there fighting the fight with you. Please welcome Diane Grossman. I figured the narrative needed to come from me and not from the outside world. And I started seeing that news stories were being told about Mallory, but not from our perspective. She opened herself, her heart, to all of us. And we were all touched by her life story. I traveled outside of New Jersey first to do a very PowerPoint presentation. And I just remember thinking this is again is not what kids need. They don't need a sermon. I again uh, went back to the drawing boards and for me it was important to make sure that I had a message that was relevant and age appropriate. Our sweet spot of who we speak to is 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th. Obviously we talked to 9th, 10th, and 11th, 12th graders, high school. I don't think that Mallory's message needs to be heard any younger than fourth grade from us. I think that that's a conversation for the professionals and I think that there's a more animated way to do it. I thought the best way to explain to children was to tell Mallory's story and to walk them through the various chapters of her life that led up to what was going on and how she felt. So I brought Mallory with us today. This is her first day of school in fifth grade. So does she look like some of, does she look like she might be one of our friends? Might be somebody we might want to hang out with? Perfect. We have this idea that bullying is this big explosive thing that happens. You know, you see the big heavy set kid pushing on the little kid in the lockers and you see kids walking in the hall and just ignoring it. And that's not necessarily the reality of children like Mallory of what their life is like. It's a lot more subtle. It's a lot more relational bullying. And because these gateway behaviors are sometimes so intangible, it makes it difficult. So the best way I thought to do was just walk them through what Mallory's life was like from the end of fifth grade all the way through sixth grade so that they could see that their everyday actions leave black marks on the canvas of who we are. And to take this picture and let them see the buildup and allow the children to grasp how their words matter. And that's really how the presentation was really born. 
Mallory, you're a rich white girl. Hey, Mallory, you didn't get to come to the party. Somebody say sorry to Mallory. Sorry, Mallory. All right, well, we're going to wipe these off, right? Oh, look at that. You said sorry. You didn't mean to say that. Is that going to come off? Oh, you mean it's permanent? You mean your words matter? You mean the things that you say to someone, even though you said sorry and you didn't mean it, you mean your words matter? You mean the things that you say out? It's very humbling. I've had school administrators, people that have been in education for their entire life, 20 plus years, and it's very humbling to hear that our presentation is one of the best presentations that they've ever heard. I'm not PowerPointing you, so the video that you saw, that was it. That's the electronic portion. I believe in roundtabling things. I believe in having an honest conversation. Because we don't use PowerPoints. We don't use the screen in that manner. We talk to them. I talk very off the cuff, just like I'm doing here today. And I think that that's authentic voice that we give to bullying that really helps it be understood, not only by the staff and the administration, but more importantly, the students. I think that when you have hundreds of kids come up to you after the presentation and say, Mrs. Grossman, I've been to tons of presentations, but yours is the best. And I still get messages from kids through Instagram and through Facebook and through email saying, Ms. Grossman, I want you to know I've not taken my bracelet off since everything happened. I want you to promise me today that you're going to wear the Mallory's Army Band, not because you feel sorry because Mallory died. I'm not here for you to feel sorry for me. I'm here for you to make a difference in your life. I want you to be a better person. I want you to be a better person. I want you to be a better person. Leaving that footprint behind allows them to remember it. The other thing that we do is we leave the poster of Mallory all scarred up. We leave that behind. Mallory's story is not this like gigantic, sensational story. It is a series of tiny little black marks on the soul of who she was. Tiny little marks. Imagine a precious painting and if we took a Sharpie and every time we saw Monet, we just walked by and just put a little black mark on it. It would no longer have the value that it should have. Imagine, tiny little black marks. So it becomes this really damaged visual of what happens when you mistreat someone. So every time they walk by the halls and they see that poster, it strikes them because it's a visual and it makes them feel uncomfortable. And then what we do is encourage the schools to take that poster, make it a bulletin board and have the kids feel positive affirmations around it. It doesn't make the black marks go away. Is that ink ever going to come out of our t-shirt? Nope. Stays with you. But it gives them actionable things, pen to paper, to help them understand that they have to tell Susie that her shoes are nice or to remind Johnny that he has a friend or someone to talk to. It allows them to almost have a little bit of control in a world that they have no control over. The number one question that gets asked is what did Mallory do? So we don't talk about that. We keep that very private. We like for schools to understand that our message is not a you know, suicide prevention message. It's really about behavior because behavior is the one thing that we can change today to make a difference. So that's the first thing. The second question that always gets asked is accountability. What happened to the girls and their families? That is so important for school administrators to pay attention to because we always joke, they want other people to get into trouble, but they don't want to get into trouble. That's why I say consequences. Children need to learn to be able to predict the consequences of their behavior. So it's really important for schools to reference and say, well, you wanted those people to get in trouble, what about you? Kids like to see accountability. And so that's extremely important because that actually is part of their growth, boundaries. The next question that they always ask, of course, is how am I doing? They always ask questions about Carly. They ask about Seth. So then there is the compassion side of what's going on. And I always tell schools that if you just sit back and let them talk, you'll learn a lot about the temperature of what's going on in your own hallways. You can learn a lot from kids. Why don't you stop being right and start listening to the CEOs of the hallways? Because that's exactly what they are. You think you're running the building? Nope, they are. 
Every sixth, seventh, and eighth grade girl who thinks that she's the most popular one in that building is running it. You just think that you're in charge. There are two children that cry in our presentations. Ones that have some apologizing to do and ones that need to be apologized to. So if guidance and administration can pay attention to those children, that's a perfect opportunity to open up dialogue. And it's okay that the kids need to apologize to someone. That's the whole point of us coming out to the school, is to teach them how to articulate what's going on in their lives. You really need to have that bird's eye view to understand the personalities and the relationships within your building. So create circumstances that do that. Whether it's outside on the playground, whether it's in your lunchroom, but really take the time to, in, to look at what's going on and identify children who might be in crisis. Kids can't say, I'm being bullied, but they can say, I feel like Mallory. Kids can't always say, I'm depressed, I'm anxious, I'm having suicidal thoughts. That vocabulary is above them. But I'm hopefully going to inspire you to recognize that you today can live a healthier, better life. When I talk about healthier, I'm talking about health up here and health here. I'm not talking about health in what you eat. But if they say, I feel like Mallory, my heart hurts like Mallory, I feel like I don't want to be here, then that's great because then we can say, good, we can talk about that, we can get you the help that you need. Over the next few years, you are going to be faced with many challenges, challenges that will directly affect your future. So being able to identify who you are will help you move forward in a positive manner. Kids are in transition. One of the biggest transitions in their lives is these three different blocks. So leaving elementary school, kids usually spend a long time in elementary, typically K through fifth grade. And not only are they transitioning out of the school that they were comfortable with, but they're also transitioning through their body. They're going through puberty, their body's changing. So they're in a, a huge emotional state. I always tell this story that one minute, Mallory's playing dress up and she's doing the hot or not video. Earlier that morning, she was playing with American Girl dolls. They are trying to transition out of being into adolescence. That's why we target that age, is that's when we really start to see the relational bullying and the gateway behaviors. Gateway behaviors are eye rolling, talking under your breath, maybe kicking their chair. This is when children start to dip their foot in the water of bullying. The next big transition in their life is high school. And the reason why, again, we try to go after the high school students is that the definition of bullying and cyberbullying is right in the same vein as hazing. We are starting to see that many colleges are taking away offers, scholarships. Kids that want to get into these really high-end schools need to understand that the things that they put online can come back to haunt them, and we've seen that recently. Now that the girls have decided they've put all these black marks on Mallory, they're not done yet. You know what they do? They take her picture. You can post something really, really funny about someone, right? Oh my God, did you see him? He was wearing a blue shirt and blue shoes. Nobody likes that. You can take a picture of him, and on Snapchat it goes away, right? Right? Does it? You're right. It doesn't go away. It doesn't go away. See, the girls thought that it went away, and they said to Mallory, you have no friends. They said, poor Mal. And then the biggest one of all, They said, go kill yourself. Where these schools, particularly Ivy League or in that second tier Ivy, is taking away really firm offers and saying, we don't want it here because we don't want that hate. We don't want to be associated with that. So it depends on the message, but both of them are, are important because both of those categories are in transition.
I always tell this story in my parents' presentation, which is the evening presentation. You can't have one without the other. A chair has four legs, right? And we need all four of those legs to be firm because if one of those legs is wobbly, so our four legs are our parents, our community, the kids, and our school system, all four of them. So in the evening presentation, I explain to parents, this is why you're starting to see these issues. The first one is, is when kids go off to preschool, it's my mommy said. My mommy says I don't have to take a nap. My mommy says I don't have to eat my carrots. So as a teacher, we're struggling because we're like, well, in school you have to do this. Then all of a sudden, when they get into kindergarten and first grade, second grade, it's my teacher says. And we always joke because the teacher says, well, you have to do math this way, but then we look at them and go, we have no idea what common core math is. And so my teacher says, around third or fourth grade, it becomes my friend says. The minute that they say, my friend said, we have to, as parents, adults, recognize we've lost them. They have transitioned into a place where their peers and the people that are around them is so much more important than what we have to say. And I think if we can acknowledge that, validate it, and then teach them how your peers have a positive influence, but they can also have a negative, and that there may come a time where you feel uncomfortable in what your peers are doing. There's a reason why we call it peer pressure. I think for some reason we've ignored that and we've skipped it. And so acknowledging it and giving the children an example of what can happen if you behave this way and showing them the visual of Mallory being healthy and happy and everything's fine to ending her own life, they can grasp it. You know, the other thing that we do is that we expect our children to be able to be resilient. Resilient behavior, which is the whole sticks and stones, words do hurt. Resilient behavior, your children aren't born with resilient behavior. That comes from a lifelong of struggles and trying to figure it out. Everyone says, well, why didn't you just kick their ass? If you just, if you just, you can take a bully down. Not everybody has that type of personality. I can tell you right now, my daughter Mallory, she would have never confronted her bullies. She would have never given them a piece of her mind. She just wanted to fit in. And part of the presentation is understanding that the pathway to resilience has changed. We used to be very social. and We use a screenshot and a slide that shows up at the top half is 1980 where the kids were playing and they're outside and they're social. And then all of a sudden in the next screen of that, we show children hovered around the same tree staring at their screen. Our children are lacking communication skills. They do. They don't know how to communicate with one another. That is, number one, it's part of their age. Number two, we introduced most of your children were born with a cell phone in the delivery room. <laughs> they were. And they were given an iPad at some time around the toddler age, and they are completely connected 24-7. They can communicate and have an entire conversation and dialogue without ever speaking a word. We cannot like it all we want, but 2020 is a prime example as to we are now living in a world where they're screenagers. They're no longer teenagers. They have a different way of socializing, and so their peers and the way that they engage with their peers has dramatically changed. And we have to educate to that and let them see it and create circumstances that builds resilient behavior and not assuming that they have it. One of the biggest things that I see is that they can relate to Mallory. She's very relatable because they can see her, they see what she looks like, and she looks normal to them. There was something that they did years ago when I worked in preschool and they had a police officer come out and they had all of our pre-K students draw a picture of what a stranger looks like. And all the kids drew this monster of what a stranger looks like. And then we showed these to the parents that when you talk about stranger danger, that to a child, a stranger is going to look like a monster because that's how we've painted it. Well, the same thing applies here. When you talk about what a bullied kid looks like, a child will think about a kid that's awkward, or a kid that's overweight, or a kid that has bad skin, or is on the spectrum, or has disabilities. They don't necessarily point out that she is a blonde-haired, petite cheerleader. That's not what they picture. As a matter of fact, when we were on the Today Show, I remember him looking at me and saying, Mallory looks like a child that would be doing the bullying. And I thought, you know what, you're right. It's our attitude around the pretty, attractive, 
got her stuff together cheerleader when the reality is is bullying doesn't have a kind. It doesn't have a shape and it's just like stranger danger. That whatever your perception of a child that is bullied looks like, I want you to wipe that chalkboard clean. Mallory's story in our presentation dummies down all of the preconceived notions that we have about children that are bullied and makes it so real and very relevant to them. So the first thing I talk about during the school presentation is common ground. Common ground is something that's really missing from our everyday speech. The number one reason why children don't let other children sit at the table with them is they have not figured out how to figure out what common ground is. More than likely every kid at the table likes pizza. I have a question for the children that are standing up. Right? This is a little icebreaker. Do you guys sit at the same lunch table? No, right? Okay, now listen to my words. Listen to my words. Stay standing if you like pizza. When you find common ground with someone, you are more likely to be sympathetic to their way of life, and then you're less likely to humiliate, intimidate, and bully them. It's the way that people relate to one another and they find commonalities. I have everybody stand up that has different activities. Some like soccer, some like gymnastics, some like dance, some like reading, some like writing. I have them all stand up. Then I ask them three questions. Do you like pizza? And they all go, yeah, I like pizza. Some like pepperoni, some like vegetable, but everybody likes pizza. Do you like candy? Yeah, some like chocolate, some like Sour Patch but we all like candy. Do we like streaming videos on either YouTube or Hulu or Netflix or whatever? And they all go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, we just showed you that the soccer kids have something in common with the kids who like reading. Again, they don't have to be best friends, but what we teach them early on is that a child that has a sports background and a child that has an academic can have three things in common. It has been proven that children will be more likely to stand up for one another if they're being bullied if they know that they have common ground. I'm not suggesting that everybody in here hold hands and sing Kumbaya. I'm not suggesting that. I'm suggesting that you watch what you say and you watch what you do and that you find common ground among the people that just because they're different than you, just because they like math and just because they like science and just because they like soccer, doesn't mean that you don't have something in common with them. Do you think the girls that bullied Mallory, do you think they might have had things in common with her? Probably, right? Right? Do you think if they had let her sit at the table and said, Mallory, what's your favorite food? Mallory would have said tacos. How many of you in here like tacos? Taco Tuesday. It was a real thing at our house. I don't eat tacos on Tuesday anymore. Teachers can literally adopt that philosophy from day one after we leave into their classrooms. Put kids together in groups and tell them that you have five minutes to find three things in common. Just doing that little exercise can make a big difference. The next part of our presentation is resilient behavior. We think that people are born resilient, and some people are. People will say, well, she's just thick-skinned. Okay, there is some truth to that, but it's generally their experience through life that has built up their resiliency. So we talk about how being not as social as we used to be compared to as social as we are now or antisocial and how we have to put systems in place to teach children how to be more social. We need the human interaction and I think 2020 has been a huge example as to why we need the human connection, that we are starting to see high levels of anxiety, high levels of stress, because kids need other kids and they don't need them just through a screen. So we talk about resilience and what it was like in the 1980s when I was growing up and how bullying has evolved. Today, if five or six kids don't like you at school, after school through cyberbullying, the five or six kids and their 900 followers. We just spent the last 10 years making a huge mistake, giving our kids electronics, letting them sign up for social media, dummying that down for them. And then of course, we talk about what happened to Mallory and we use the everyday permanent marker. Even though you didn't mean to hurt someone, doesn't mean that you didn't. And no matter how many times you say, I'm sorry, the black mark stays because it's permanent. So we show the children how destroyed the picture of Mallory is 
by the words that are used and how it affected her. And then, of course, I think it's so important to leave children with a positive message. I don't want Mallory's message to be about her sad story because she's so much more than that. And so we talk about what living a bracelet kind of life is all about. We talk about the cool kids. 56 middle schools, Yale, Princeton, and Rutgers participated in this case study. In New Jersey, they can reduce bullying in their school by more than 30% by wearing the blue band. It's not just an awareness band. It's almost like I'm in a special club. And now that I've heard Mallory's presentation, I put this band on and it's a signal to maybe someone else that, yeah, we're a part of this and we're in this together. A bracelet kind of life is wearing a blue band on your arm that reminds you to be kind to one another. And so kids treat it almost like a uniform. And I've seen kids in pictures that I talked to two and a half, three years ago, and they're like, Miss Grossman, I've not taken it off. And that means it's working. It's the ripple effect. It's truly throwing in that one stone and watching how it spreads. And that's really ultimately as we teach them how to live a bracelet kind of life and take the Mallory's Army Pledge. After I've had a conversation with the kids that day, and it's about an hour long presentation, and again, I can stay an hour, I can stay 45 minutes, I can stay an hour and a half. I tell the schools, you have me for the day. And I've gone in and out of classrooms and followed up. It's really about a whole day of being with the kids. The parents' presentation is really about getting back to the basics of parenting. So we talk parents through what is HIB, what does it stand for. But you should have an HIV document. If you don't have one, please grab one real quick. We're not going to spend a ton of time on it, but I feel that every family should have an HIV document. If you don't, this is your opportunity to grab one. We give them the Cliff Notes version of what the kids heard, but we also talk to them about their responsibility. It's okay to give our children this digital technology, but where's the parenting associated with it? One of the key things we talk about is kids use their phone as an alarm clock. Well, they don't need their phone 24-7. If your child has a bachelor's degree in Snapchat, you better have a master's or your child shouldn't be using it. There, I'm done, good night. Um, it's that simple. Your children should not be using something that you don't know about. So that is my soapbox on social media. Yes, I believe that social media is an important tool. It's what brought you all here today, more than likely. It's what brought you to know me. So I think that you'll never hear me say no to social media. You will hear me say be responsible. Social media is your child's coffee shop. Social media is your kid's bowling alley, your roller skating rink, and your mall. Guess what happens at the bowling alley? Guess what happens at the mall? At some point it closes. My dad used to say, nothing good happens after 11 o'clock. He was right. So why doesn't their mall close? One of the biggest problems we're having is that their mall never closes. And so how can they ever take a break from it if we as parents never step in and take them away? The mall closes at nine o'clock. You need to put those systems in place. You need to allow it to charge downstairs. Children can never appreciate the life that they have if all they're ever doing is looking into a life that's perceived to be better or worse than theirs, if they're always looking at their friends on vacation or they're always looking at their second beach house, how can they ever appreciate the life? We have to teach them how to appreciate that life. And you, unfortunately, have to be a parent and not a friend. I know that it's very uncomfortable and we like to believe that if we're closer to our children that they'll come to us, they'll confide in us, they'll tell us what's going on. Mallory is an example. Everybody will tell you that knew Mallory, that knew me. Mallory and I were super close. She told me a fraction of what was going on. And that's probably the core message out of everything that I say to parents is that we have to parent in a digital world. And what we're doing is we're still trying to parent and say things like, well, when I was a kid, this is what I did. It doesn't matter what it was like in 1980. That's not their journey. They're kids in 2020, and we can all agree that it is so vastly different than when we were kids that we have to start parenting to that world. And that presentation's about an hour and a half, sometimes two hours, because I do get wordy. But everything I say is important, I think. Sometimes kids will come to the presentation and they'll sit with their parents, and it'll be something that they hear together as a message. And I've told parents, if you want to make me the bad guy by saying, Mrs. Grossman said you're not allowed to have your phone after 9 o'clock, I'm okay with that. 
Sometimes the solutions are right in front of us, but we are so afraid to parent our children because we live in a world where our children are closer to us. We allow our children to have a say-so. There used to be a scenario where the kids were seen and not heard. Our children have evolved, and we're seeing it right now with the temperature of the environment of what's going on out in the world. These young people do have a voice. We have the right to listen to it, and we should listen to it, but we should also remember that their experience and their immature brains allow them to think in a completely different manner, and so we have to continue to parent in that same vein. Cyberbullying is real, and it's different than other bullying. You can't change what you don't acknowledge. If you don't acknowledge that cyberbullying is harder for a child than regular, everyday bullying, that's the first step, is recognizing it. Use teachable moments. If you catch your kid doing something online that they're not supposed to be doing, put the phones down, have a conversation. I trust me, it's much easier to have a conversation when you're proactive than when you're reactive and trying to figure out what's really going on. We have to understand the psychology around gossip. And I think that that's extremely important for parents to realize that when you're being talked about, whether it's true or not, there is this emotional connection that happens. We talk a lot about that. We also have to recognize that maybe children that are 13 don't need to be using apps that teach you how to hide content from your parents. It's okay to give your children social media. It's okay to let them do things, but don't give them a platform that allows people to come in and say bad things about them. I give example kids that have YouTube channels. There's an, literally a section that allows you to have comments. If your child is not thick-skinned enough to receive those comments, or they're having a difficult time, or they don't want to be talked about, and they don't want it shared, then maybe don't give them that platform. We don't give kids keys to a car on the day that they turn 15. There's a series of steps that they have to do to earn it, and that's really what happens with digital responsibility. You earn it, and you have baby steps as you go through the process, and then by the time you get to be 16, 17, 18, after you have a proven track record of not abusing technology, then you can have it on a full scale. But I think that what happens is it's almost like a free-for-all. They turn 10 years old and all of a sudden they have the iPhone 11 and they have every app that's ever been developed and then we wonder why they're struggling with it. It's too much content for their age. They're just not mature enough. As parents, we have to kind of step back and sometimes we have to be the bad guy and say, no, you're not mature enough to handle that and that's okay. Branding is so important. We are in a society filled with brands. Nike, Under Armour, everything has a brand. Children associate with brands. Hollister, Abercrombie, every child has something that's branded and they go through phases. A lot of times kids can't say, I'm in this club or I'm, I'm in the kindness club or kindness is cool because they're, you know, they're kids. As they came into the building, I started to see the wrist of all the children and seeing this Mallory's Army band, it just warms me. So Mallory's Army, brand allows them to wear a sweatshirt or a t-shirt or a water bottle or whatever it is. It allows them to say, yeah, I get it, I'm a part of it, without them having to wear their feelings on their sleeves, per se. It also is a way for other children to put it on like their super cape. We were inspired by her wisdom and kind words. After meeting the Grossman family, it was confirmed that we too shared in her vision. From that day on, we knew we were part of Mallory's Army. So the brand is really, not only does it represent Mallory like the pajama pants. Mallory wore pajama pants everywhere she went. If she could, she would wear them everywhere. They became a part of her. Well, now kids can put pajama pants on and it's a part of our brand. The hoodie, the t-shirt, the bracelets, all of that. It's just our, it's our uniform. The Army has a uniform and this is what ours is. And it's just a great way for kids to say, I want to be in this club and it's easy for them. It's their way of sharing, hey, I'm on something, but I can still be cool. I think Mallory's Army brand is very unisex and everyone from every genre of life can put that hoodie or sweatshirt on or whatever it is and feel like they're part of something. It's so much bigger than themselves. She gave us a few strategies on how to manage our behavior. 
So for schools and administrators and teachers, teachers need to start infusing resilient behavior, emotional intelligence, and common ground into their everyday teachings. They have to. I think school administrators need to stop saying zero tolerance and understand that there is a tolerance because it's behavior, but put systems in place. When children can predict the consequences of their behavior, that's step one. It's not about having zero tolerance. It's about children understanding that if I do something, this is what's going to happen to me. And sometimes those consequences are really painful. When someone contacts you and says your kid is behaving poorly, stop defending the behavior. Every kid in this room is going to make a mistake. They're going to do something that they regret. And you should be prepared for that phone call. And you should say, thank you so much for contacting me. Bring me that phone, right? and parents need to be able to accept that their children do do things that are wrong, they do make mistakes, and not being able to go to the fifth grade or sixth grade dance is not the end of the world, but it's a great lesson for the children to learn. I'd rather them learn about not being able to go to the sixth grade dance than to learn about criminal behavior at 18. I think we all walk away with homework, with the presentations, and we give them a lot of food for thought, including the kids. You know, the kids have to get involved but we as adults have to create the systems to allow them to get involved. It's just my way to give back. I think that when you, someone described grief as loving someone so much that you, can, you can't give it to them anymore because they're gone. So I have so much love for Mal. This is my way of giving love to a community that deserves it. And so for me, it's therapy in the sense of it's grief and it gives me a place to park the pain, but also show how much, not only do I love Mallory, but I do love the world that we live in. And I just think it's, if God has graced me with the gift of gab, then why not leverage that? And I know that through our story that we're helping people. So why wouldn't I continue that? It's just been my way to give back to the world that I love. I guess I think sometimes I couldn't save Mallory, but I can save them.